I agree with Senator Thomas only that we want to keep the state government operating. I agree that there's some funding that we need in this bill. I disagree that this is appropriate to pass today. I think we should send it with no vote, sit down with the governor in the House and tell them these things are not acceptable to the Senate. We want them taken out. We don't want to negotiate. Just get out a red pen and strike through those provisions. That's policy provisions here. I'm not going to go into all the details of the things that shouldn't be in here, such as all the game and fish things. I think there are a lot of members of the Senate might have wanted to vote on some of those provisions, but they have no chance other than is it part of an omnibus budget bill. But those aren't the things I'm going to focus on today. I'm going to focus on what one columnist actually I think described as environmental vandalism, where in order to get a budget that we feel we need, I think the state needs, I think the governor and the legislature recognize this is our number one job this year is to pass a budget. That the only way you can get this budget is if you'll take all these unacceptable provisions. There are, I'll give a couple of examples. The Pollution Control Agency Citizens Board. Some people say, well, we can come back and fix it next year. We actually have a Pollution Control Agency Citizens Board today. If we pass this bill, two months from now there won't be one. After almost 50 years, we won't have a citizen's board anymore. Some say this is unique, and state government it pretty much is. But it's not, this is not a thing for St. Paul bureaucrats. This is not for the PCA. This is for citizens. Citizens who find the bureaucrats not listening to them. People find their messages not being heard. That's who it's for. One issue that drew a lot of attention this year that I think drew some of the people to want to abolish the board, a certain situation in a dairy proposal in western Minnesota. The people who came to speak before the citizens board weren't people from St. Paul. The people who came were the neighboring farmers, the local county board folks, local people. They didn't feel their address, their concerns about the environmental risk was being addressed by the agency. They did not feel it was adequate. The proposer didn't have half the land they needed to spread the manure on. They didn't test adequately if they had enough water supply for 130 million gallons a year. Earlier this year, the only policy discussion we had on this wasn't about abolishing the board. But we had a hearing earlier this year in my committee in which we talked about the importance of the board. And we had a woman, a farmer, from a couple miles down the road from this proposed dairy farm. She said, dust, other things aren't addressed. She said, last summer, because the same dairy has, I think, three other huge dairies in, in the county, she said that she cleaned an inch and a half of dust out of her closed mailbox from big trucks going in every day, every five minutes, trucks to bring food, trucks to bring out milk, trucks going in and out constantly, and whether the roads can handle it, all those issues they felt had not been adequately addressed. So they had one place to turn, the Citizens Board. And the Citizens Board, in a rare example, said, you're right, we don't think there's enough information here. They didn't stop the project. They simply said, you gotta do a more thorough review. That citizens board is not for the PCA. It's not for bureaucrats. That's for people. It's for citizens of Minnesota to have some place to turn to, to appeal to. If we pass this bill today, that's gone. Trying to get that back, I will guarantee you, it's not gonna happen. We lose that for good. Why should we have to say, well, we wanna pass a budget so we don't shut down state parks? Why should we have to say, if we're going to do that, then we've got to get rid of the citizens board? It's been a model, and it's worked, and it hasn't been a problem. That's one provision in here. There are lots more like it. I'll mention the non-ferrous mining waste. It's a provision in here. If 
you read the bill, I can't remember what pages, I didn't look at the latest version of it. But you won't understand what it is unless you can read and identify rules. I can't even tell you what section of rules they're in. But directs two commissioners to change certain rules. Effectively, it means so that non-ferrous mining waste is exempted from our solid waste rules. That didn't get heard in any policy committee in the House or the Senate. That's something that now we get a vote on. If we want a budget, you have to vote for that, we're told. I don't think that's the case. And in conference committee, where I first had a chance to vote on it, you know, this was not well easily visible. It was tacked on at the end of three sections, and I think it was Senator Peterson's bill about landfill siting, whether who goes first, the county or the state, something we talked about for a year or two and worked out. Decent language. This is put at the end of that section, and it doesn't mention mining, it doesn't mention anything of this sort, it mentions commissioners and rules. Not transparent to the public, and I'll guarantee you, mining is always a controversial issue in Minnesota. But we're told we have to accept that. What's the urgency? We don't have non-ferrous mining in Minnesota. We might sometime, but we don't now. So we don't have any non-ferrous mining waste in Minnesota. So we don't have to deal with it now. It can go through the process. Matter of fact, some of the attorneys who work on these issues and the PCA have disagreements over the, what the impact of this language is, what's covered and what's not. We don't even have clarity of what it means, but we have to get rid of it now as part of this budget. And I resent the fact that we are told if we want to pass a budget, we have to prove all of these things. And there's uh, other proposals in here that shouldn't be in there. This one's a budget one. But we, I think in a huge mistake, a couple weeks ago in a different bill, passed a policy change in a good bill from last year, a consumer issue. We passed a provision saying that the well-liked by the public pollinator-friendly labeling we set up in place, basically saying if plants had been treated with certain pesticides that are toxic to pollinators, you, had, you couldn't label them as pollinator friendly. If they were not, you could label them that way. In effect, the law was changed this year, so it can be pollinator friendly. If you can't observe the impact on the pollinator upon a contact with the plant, that's nice. That means if a bee or butterfly touches a plant one time, it doesn't fall over, you know? It's impacted though. The impact on the nervous system is cumulative and most of these pollinators are going to touch multiple plants. In effect, what that legislation says is you can now label something as pollinator friendly if it doesn't kill, if it's toxic, but doesn't kill the pollinator on the first contact. That's dishonest. I think that really is an offensive thing to constituents, to the public, and I think we're all going to be hearing a lot about that. What does this bill have to do with it? We're putting in public taxpayer dollars to promote that false labeling. That has to come out of this bill. That does not belong in there. On biofuels and biochemicals, there's some good language that was worked out by a coalition of agriculture people, of environmentalists, of economic development folks, and so on, a good <coughs> package. I agreed to hear the bill as a package because it was that way. Senator Saxhog agreed we'd keep it as an entire package and to the Senate's credit, it did. What came out of conference committee took out a key portion of that. Something that could stimulate the idea of perennial grasses being used as a new biofuel. If it's not, we are putting in, I believe it's about six million dollars per year per plant. It's not all in this bill, it's what would come once we start moving forward with this, that would be largely, probably very heavily stocked with corn stover. Taking some corn stover off the land does increase runoff of nutrients, of soil, pesticides, the very thing the buffer bill is trying to prevent against. So we have a provision in this bill that's moving contrary to the buffer bill. And we're going to be using public money, large amounts of public money to do this. 
I think the biochemical portion, the other portions of it make good sense. But we should not go forward with a half package that's going to make our water quality worse. Because it's not like we can say status quo is okay. That's the whole reason for all the controversy over the buffer bill. Because we have to improve and significantly improve our waters. So we're moving and we're using our tax dollars in this bill to go backwards on that. I don't think it's okay to say, if we want this budget, we have to accept these. I think we're going to hear from our constituents. I think we've already begun hearing from them. I think it makes people cynical, that pollinator friendly thing. I mean, can anybody with a straight face say that something that doesn't kill you on first contact means it's safe and friendly? That's dishonest, and we're funding that here. And I'd say what we have to do, I don't want to have long negotiations. I think everybody in this room cares about state employees and that they're not laid off. I think we all care about that, and it doesn't have to be that way. We don't have to have long, complex negotiations. We get out a red pen, we sit down with the governor and say, these are things the Senate wouldn't live with. Take them out, period. Why is all this policy in this bill in the first place? I realize the whole reason for omnibus budget bills is because we have thousands of different proposals and programs and agencies and things to fund. And you can't have 2,000 bills to deal with 2,000 appropriations. So you put appropriations together. But this is an omnibus budget bill. It's not supposed to be making huge changes that have not been approved by, in the case of the Citizens Board, that didn't pass the House floor. It didn't pass the Senate floor. It was put in in conference committee. Huge change like that. And I think our constituents are rightly angry at this. I think we should be rightly angry at this. And we should not be put in a place where we have no choice. I urge us to vote down the bill today. It can be a quick thing. It just once we have the votes to reject it, then we sit down with the governor and the House and say the Senate would not pass this bill in this shape. Let's reject it. Let's take care of it, not by saying, well, we negotiate this and that. Just say these things are not okay and we're going to take them out. I've got a red pen. Plenty of other people do too. It won't take long. But I strongly urge us to vote against this. We do not have to take our environment backwards in order to pass a state budget. It doesn't take two weeks to resolve that. It takes one day. Thank you. Madam Senator Thomasoni. Madam President, um, I think the, the, the notion of the red pen is naive at best. Um, I'm, I've been watching this um, um, process go on now for the last five months as well as um, passing a bill and then having it vetoed and then having the negotiations go on for two weeks and having the veto message uh, satisfied to the governor's uh, approval. And, and to think that um, just <coughs> nilly-willy saying that we should just bring it back to the governor and cross out some provisions um, is uh, not something that's going to be uh, easy to negotiate. I, I feel that if we don't pass this today, we are in an imminent uh, position of laying off state workers in all of these departments and uh, a partial government shutdown, which I don't think is a good thing for the state of Minnesota and I don't think it's a good thing for the people of Minnesota. Um, you know, I really, I really take offense to the statement that mining has always been a controversial issue in Minnesota. You know, we've been mining on the Iron Range for 130 years and um, we've been given credit for winning two world wars. Um, for building the roads and highways and the infrastructure of the United States and our industry is in a world of hurt without a doubt right now and trying to, trying to say that uh, mining is controversial when uh, that's how the people in my area of the state make their living I, I, I feel is, is not giving homage to what the Iron Range people have, have, have accomplished for this state and for the, for the people of, this, of, of the entire United States. Um, the new process of polymet and non-ferrous mining is a, is a process that has gone through extensive environmental review. They've been doing an environmental impact statement now for over 10 years. Um, they've spent over $150 million on this particular environmental impact statement. We are the first people to tell you that we want this done right, we want it done safely, we want it done in an environmentally friendly manner. The provision, of the solid waste that's in the bill, uh, 
is for non-ferrous mining operations and it already exists for ferrous mining operations. It's designed to eliminate duplicative regulation and the need to obtain overlapping permits. The provision does not allow mining operations to escape regulation of solid waste. A non-ferrous non mining operation will still be required to go through an environmental impact statement uh, and comply with the significant permitting requirements regarding solid waste. These permitting requirements assure continued protection of Minnesota's environment. The Minnesota legislature and state agencies have previously and are specifically tailored to the types of facilities and pr particular waste streams that are unique to the mining industry. This focused approach meets the broader resource protection goals Excuse me. Um, okay, the Minnesota legislature and state agents have previously recognized that imposing solid waste requirements in addition to a permit to mine and SDS requirements would be highly duplicative and unnecessarily costly and would create inefficiencies for both mining companies and regulators without creating any additional benefits in terms of environmental or human protection. As was indicated in the 1998 Statement of Need and Reasonableness, or the SONAR, when the provision was appropriately applied to ferrous mining operations for solid waste rules, further regulation of facilities, they said, further regulations of facilities accepting only solid waste generated from the ex exploration, mining, milling, smelting, and refining of ores and minerals under a solid waste management facility permit would not provide additional protection of human health or the environment. Obtaining an additional solid waste management facility permit would unnecessarily burden the applicant with no additional health or environmental protection. And uh, members, that is what this uh, provision does. It just makes it uh, not duplicative. Um, I know the Citizens Board elimination is controversial um, to many people. Um, I, I guess you can be for it or against it. Uh, I, I know that it's the only agency that has a Citizens Board. It's a Citizens Board that has a real lot of power. It's a Citizens Board that has the ability to promulgate rules. It has the ability to issue permits. It has the ability, the ability to uh, request environmental review. Um, there have been citizens boards like this in many other states and many of them have been eliminated um, and I, it was, it's the only agency in the state that has a citizens board um, and so um, I don't I, I know the governor has agreed uh, in his negotiations to accept the elimination of the board um, I, I, I believe that um, What's gone on in this bill is uh, it's been negotiated to the point where I think people can accept it and um, and I believe we should pass this because I don't think the risk of uh, not passing it today and uh, believing that it, another special session can be called quickly and without any kind of problem in negotiations is a is should be considered to be a real a real thing I think that uh, not passing it today and voting against this bill is it, it suffers the consequences of many, many people losing, losing their jobs. Senate Weber. Thank you, Madam President. <coughs> Members, I rise today to speak in favor of passing this bill. I recognize that there are elements within this bill that are not pleasing to everyone. Uh, I think that uh, I've, my first comments I wish to address as a former mayor. I think that as we look at some of the reforms that have taken place in this bill regarding the MPCA, are reforms, quite frankly, that many in city government have been fighting for for 30 years. I also tend to <clears throat> resent the implication that because we, some of us seek reforms with the MPCA that we seem not to care about the environment that we seem not to care about clean water or clean air. And yeah, I found that to be true when I served in local government. It's as if uh, those of us in government uh, at the local level uh, were always seen as, as enemies too often by the powers that be within MPCA and that they would impose upon us rules and restrictions that quite frankly we did not believe made actually good sense that many of our experts told us were not scientifically defensible. And that certainly if you were to do a cost-benefit analysis, were certainly not efficient in terms of what they were trying to accomplish. It does not take long, even for a small city like where I came from, to spend millions of dollars in changes within a wastewater treatment plant, and yet affect the water of the river into which we discharge an infinitesimal amount. 
yes, we all need to be concerned about the environment, and we all are concerned about the environment. But I think all too often we embark upon processes and rules that quite frankly diminish the public support for efforts that are made to protect the environment because they see such a failure in the rules that are being implemented in comparison to the results that are accomplished. Actually in a neighboring state they recently made some changes and upon implementing them realized what the costs were going to be to local government. They went back and did a cost-benefit analysis and the billions of dollars that this was going to impact both the local taxpayers and business and what have you has made them go back and, and take another look. Recognizing that yes we need to solve some problems but we also need to make sure that the manner in which we solve them makes sense both in terms of the science and both in terms of the community's ability to achieve a meaningful result. I recognize also that within this bill uh, there are, there's been the comment that there are some policy provisions, numerous policy provisions that have taken place. You know, in my third session I'm still a relative newcomer to the process and yet I would simply say this is certainly not the first time that I have seen that happen. And I think we can uh, stand here and say that we wish to be uh, really pure in how we approach the uh, legislative process and yet we all know that most have bended that rule a time or two in the past. And so I would, uh, I would encourage everyone to vote for this bill. I would particularly encourage the members of my caucus to vote for this bill. I think that we, uh, I know that there are other items in addition to policy that create issues. Some may think we're spending too much money in one place or another and, uh, and I can accept that. Uh, some might think that uh, we are giving away too much in other areas and I can accept that. But at the end of the day our responsibility is to come to a conclusion here that brings about a bill that is for the benefit of the entire state of Minnesota. And I think that in this particular instance, this compromise has achieved that. Yes, there are things some of us are unhappy about. There are some things that some of us think do not go far enough. There are some things which others of us think have gone too far. Uh, but no one can really disagree or argue with the fact that if all of us feel that way, well, then we've probably achieved what we can achieve in this particular instance. And so I, um, again, I repeat my uh, support for this bill. I repeat my encouragement uh, for everyone and particularly for my caucus members to support this bill. And I think that at the end of the day, uh, we will have achieved uh, the best that we can do for the state of Minnesota, uh, for the state departments that are in question, and certainly at the end of the day, I believe that in passage of this bill, we will have accomplished the responsibilities that people sent us here to do. Thank you very much. Is there any more discussion? Senator Eakin. Senator Eakin. Thank you, Madam President. Members, I uh, rise in support of the bill today. I, uh, I think that it's obviously everybody has things they want to fight for, but there is a time to compromise, and I believe that time has come. Uh, we are facing a deadline here. And this is a bill that I think is a good bipartisan bill. It's not uh, one that has everything everyone wants. Uh, I certainly didn't get everything I wanted in this bill. Uh, but there are some good things in this bill. And, you know, one example in the Red River Valley, uh, it didn't get the provisions uh, that would, uh, uh, I guess, limit the uh, rules on water quality to what North Dakota and the EPA have until there's a basin-wide strategy that's developed. Uh, didn't get that limitation, but there are going to be uh, efforts now to develop a basin-wide strategy, which is going to lead to a more effective water quality policy for the Red River Valley, and one that's done more effectively in a more cost-effective way and more effectively. Um, and so uh, I think it's important to note that with the water quality issues in particular, what we have here, it's, it's not going to be delays in the limitations uh, or limitations on the enforcement of water quality standards, but it is going to result in more disclosure. It's going to result in more transparency, more input, 
more information. And I believe that that's going to lead to a better environmental rulemaking process. Uh, I believe that it's going to lead to more effective environmental policy and more efficient use of our resources. And so I don't believe that this is a rollback of environmental standards in our state. I think it's actually moving us forward and making sure that we're doing it more effectively and, uh, and using our resources in the most effective way possible uh, to get the, the results that we want. Um, so uh, I would, again, encourage everyone to support this bill. Again, the time to compromise has arrived. Uh, that is what the people sent us down here to do, is to work together and eventually negotiate a compromise deal. So thank you. Senator Rood. Madam President and members. You know, um, when this was on the, the floor of the Senate, um, I think I stood up and told everyone how I was really tortured by this bill because uh, the environment is a very passionate thing for me and I work very hard at it on a lot of different levels um, to ensure that we leave this planet better uh, for the next generation of which I have a brand new great grandbaby this week and so I'm really, really excited about leaving a, a planet better and a and a place better for, for her. Congratulations, Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> Little Arabelle. And in this bill, there's a lot of things that, I, that I, I love. The school trust, that we're working so hard for our school children. And uh, the forestry position, uh, provisions for Greater Minnesota, they're very, um, they're very important to us. The avian flu, I, I know our, our turkey farmers have, have suffered greatly. And of course the Conservation Corps because they are, they are really a heart of teaching the next generation what, what's important. And the AIS decal that we really worked hard, you know, with over 600 lakes in my district, that's a really important piece. And all the trails and all the things that are so important in this bill. And so when we sat on the floor of the Senate, we knew that we had worked for five months on this bill. And we all worked hard for all the provisions. And so I voted for the bill off the floor because I felt after five months, we really had worked hard. So when the governor vetoed this bill, I was very shocked because we had come to that compromise. And so after two weeks, this bill comes back and all the problems that were in this bill and all the problems that we could have solved and we could have addressed, we did not. The same things that are in this bill that we found very egregious when we voted for it before, are still here. And so today, I am still tortured on this bill, and I really wish that we could do a better job in this bill. We had the opportunity to change those things, and we didn't. We still have the same bill. And so I, I want everyone here to really think about what we're doing here, because we did have the opportunity to change it, and we didn't. And we still have those things that are bothersome to so many members in this chamber. Thank you. Senator Eaton. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'd like to shine a little sunshine on the process here on the um, sulfide mining exemption language. The um, language was added in Senate File 2101 in Senator Thomasoni's committee, taken out in finance, but not in the bill passed by the Senate. It was then added as a Dill House floor amendment with little discussion and was in the House Bill and Conference Committee report with little discussion. It was never introduced as a bill or heard in any policy committee. Also, it was written to be obscure and escape notice. I too want, if we're going to have um, sulfide mining in northern Minnesota, I want it to be safe and I want it to be environmentally sound. Over 58,000 comments were submitted on PolyMet EIS and 4,000 people <coughs> braved January winds to attend the hearings. Senator Thomasoni may argue this solves the duplication of permits, but actually it removes an option for agencies to choose the appropriate type of permit leaving them to rely on the SDS, the State Discharge System Permit, and the Permit to Mine, which leaves enormous discretion to the DNR Commissioner. 
PCA had a very unsatisfying answers, had very unsatisfying answers as to how this would play out with various different types of potential waste streams from the non-ferrous mines. I think this is a very serious issue. I do not oppose mining in northern Minnesota. I oppose doing it while it pollutes the rest of our state. I, I think that um, we can pave the way and show the rest of the country how it's done safely and environmentally sound. Madam President. Senator Thomasoni. The, the comment that it pollutes the rest of the state is an outrageous comment. And um, quite frankly, I would put our water and our air up against the air and water down here any day that you want. And um, there's nothing that we're doing in the mining operations on, in, on the Iron Range that is <coughs> polluting the rest of the state. We are providing value to the rest of the state by providing a product that not only provides jobs for our area, provides health care, provides pensions, provides the ability for people to make a good living, but it also provides products that we use all across the United States and all across this state. Um, it is a necessary part of our, of our very existence. There is very little of anything that we do in this world that does not have mining involved with it. And um, if you pull out your cell phone, you'll find that there's anywhere upwards of 39 different minerals in this thing right here. Every single one of them has to be mined. And the ones that we want to mine on the Iron Range in the non-ferrous area are a lot of what's in these things, in catalytic converters, in windmills, in, in solar panels. And and to, to, to suggest that we are doing it so we can pollute the rest of the state is absolutely outrageous, Senator Egan. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, Madam President and members, um, we shouldn't be in this position. We're getting dire warnings that if we don't vote for this bill, we're contemplating shutdown. We don't actually know if that's the case. Uh, and, but we, we do know a few things um, that, are, that are facts. I, I think this bill is a, an historic bill. Uh, I think it's an historic step backwards on what we've been able to build in Minnesota over the course of many generations now. Through very, very difficult political circumstances, many trials in this body and others, hard fought gains to build a legacy that we could all be proud of to leave an environment for our generations to come to enjoy. Preserved, clean, safe, productive, not used up, that upholds our quality of life, our values, and our health. And I believe strongly that this moves us <coughs> backwards, contrary to a legacy in a violation of a legacy that's been left to us. I'll read a passage that was in the newspaper recently. Legislators are brazenly putting the needs of special interests over Minnesota's treasured national res natural resources with an agriculture and environment budget bill that undercuts critical pollution safeguards. In doing so, they also set an alarming warning to anyone in years to come who challenge powerful interests. Those who ask hard questions so should expect political payback. In future elections, voters should ask, how did incumbents vote on a bill that so clearly prioritized special interests over Minnesota's natural resources? Those are strong words. We inherit the legacy of Willard Munger and so many others who passed before us. I understand the nature of omnibus bills. And Senator Weber is correct. Sometimes policy does find its way into these budget bills. And sometimes there's a couple of stinkers I voted for a few and I've had to go back to my district and explain in the interest of moving forward, in the interest of finding some reasonable compromise, there's give and take, there's trade-offs. At last count, Madam President and members, there are at least 13 measures that put us significantly backwards in unwinding the hard work and the policies, the allocation of resources that we've been able to achieve over many years. The Citizens Board. The PCA is not the only entity that has a Citizens Board. We install Citizens Boards for a lot of good reasons in a lot of places. Housing Finance Agency, Met Council. We've heard many, many speeches 
in this chamber. We've been excoriated by certain newspaper columnists that we can't violate one dollar that's been allocated and designated by one of our legacy citizens boards. LCCMR is another one. You know, so you know, we, we were told yesterday that, that process is good. Uh, when you get stuff in that you like, process is bad. Uh, when stuff gets into a bill that you don't like. Well, I'll, I'll uh, venture that citizens boards are good when you agree with them and they're your citizens that are upholding the things you want and perhaps citizens boards are bad when you disagree and we should just simply abolish them. But we have a long tradition. We have literally <coughs> dozens upon dozens of citizens boards who do hard work and help us craft policy and allocate <coughs> resources and we try our hardest to uphold and honor that work for very, very good reasons. And this particular citizens board has done outstanding work and this is clearly in reaction to one decision that they made by a very, very powerful interest. I don't understand how it is that we uh, broke a compromise on what was a good idea, the biofuels initiative. And all the stakeholders came together and came up with an outstanding uh, compromise so that we could certainly use uh, the corn product, but we could also do cover crops and maybe improve our ability to preserve our land resources, to preserve our water resources, to also uh, spark uh, the next generation of cellulosic biofuels. And that was hard and excellent work Senator Saxhog shepherded. And everyone was pleased. And then we just, I guess, saw it upon ourselves to simply break that, that, that great uh, coming together of a diverse set of stakeholders. I think we've all uh, come to understand that sulfide mining is more, mo most likely going to happen in Minnesota. But we've said, and everyone seems to always say, we want sulfide mining to be as safe as possible. We know for a fact that sulfide mining in other places in this country and other countries has had devastating consequences on their water. Devastating. With sulfuric acid leaching out of the tailings into the water, the groundwater and the surface water. We know that the waters of northern Minnesota are extremely sensitive to their pH. They're cold lakes, very, very sensitive to interruption. So why prematurely uh, grant this exemption before we even know uh, if it's needed or not? And environmental review is not permitting. It's a different matter altogether that precedes permitting. Permitting that's informed by rules. Suspending wild rice, protections for wild rice to some point in the distant future. Meanwhile, the wild rice just can sit there. Tying state agencies' hands on environmental review. So that companies permitting process are not enforced uh, with a prior warning. Yeah. Um, Sarah Nelson, for what purpose does the um, gentlewoman rise? Madam President, um, point of order. Uh, Senate point. Rule 36, debate. Members shall speak only to the question under debate and avoid personality. And it also reminds me of Mason's 142. We are not to impugn motives. The speaker has said that hard questions are political payback. That is impugning motives. And Madam President and members, our job is to ask the hard questions and to assume that those are political payback is impugning motives and, uh, of, and personality. And it is against our Senate rules and our traditions. Senator Dibble. Uh, Madam President, I apologize if, uh, if I violated the rules. Okay, why don't you, thank you, Senator Nelson. Why don't you continue, Senator Dibble? Uh, Madam President, uh, Senator Marty uh, brought up this subject that it uh, bears repeating. How, how on earth are we going to be able to go back to our own districts and tell our constituents that it is quite possible that they're going to go to their local nursery and buy a bunch of lovely plants 
uh, for the purpose of attracting bees and butterflies and, and other sorts of pollinators, uh, plants that very possibly have been cultivated with systemic pesticides so that within their very branches and leaves and flowers, they have pesticides that have sublethal effects on pollinators. They're putting together butterfly gardens and bee gardens and those sorts of things with plants that are labeled pollinator friendly that themselves harm pollinators. We know from the amazing research that's being done at the University of Minnesota, research that we funded with new labs and, and new research dollars and that sort of thing, nation setting research, that this issue of the declining pollinators, myriad wild pollinators, the domestic bee population, our butterflies, is complicated and multifaceted. And it's not that necessarily these neonicotinoids kill bees on contact. Sometimes there's a sublethal effect and they make bees, basically they make bees sick and make them less capable of foraging, less capable of operating as a community in a hive and hence we have this tremendous amount of, of hive collapse as of one aspect of many. We know that and so we're going to be asking people, we saw the, the, uh, the White House initiative uh, a few days ago wanting to put a, a million gardens out there that help uphold and support uh, pollinators throughout the country. And we're going to potentially be selling folks plants that are pollinator friendly that are exactly the opposite because of a provision in this. Exempting cities from the metro water supply, you know, restructuring our, our metropolitan area water supply planning advisory committee, um, undoing uh, cost analyses that have already been done by the PCA. You know, on the one hand, uh, we, <laughs> on the one hand, we eliminate the citizens board uh, because the PCA is doing fine work and is fully adequate, and and we cite the approval of the PCA, and so we don't need a set of independent eyes to review their work. And then we uh, then we hear speeches about how oh they're just arbitrary, capricious, not basing their decisions on on science. They're just kind of taking their best guess because they're a bunch of tree huggers. There's no sense in in the very speeches that we're hearing. So we're we're making them go back and unwind all of their work. I'm happy that the uh, the Metropolitan Landfill. Contingency Action Trust is going to have a repay for the dollars that are diverted. I'm not quite sure why we're diverting those dollars in, in times of surplus. Um, that's fantastic. Um, but we've been uh, rating that fund uh, to the tune of over $43 million. Uh, this is, of course, uh, to close our landfills and make sure that uh, in the future they don't have ongoing tremendous environmental consequence uh, for the areas in which they sit. And, uh, and then uh, this polluter amnesty provision, uh, Madam President. Uh, so if, if, if folks, uh, quote, self-report, uh, suddenly uh, the PCA is stripped of all of its powers and enforcement uh, authority. And finally, I just have to say on this, on this uh, so-called uh, nuisance study, um, it's going right to an agenda that's been, that's been, we've seen in state after state after state of trying to eliminate the ability of citizens and businesses and frankly agricultural interests themselves to deal with um, operations and consequences that have <coughs> terrible negative consequences on their ability to live where they live, to conduct their businesses, to have any semblance of quality of life because of the gross violations of particular operations around them. Um, they're, they're, these are not uh, uh, frivolous lawsuits. When, a, when a, a lawsuit is brought against a nuisance that's nearby, it's for a significant reason of significant harm and consequence that's occurring uh, to those around. Uh, we just saw the, uh, the uh, in is issue of the uh, stranded electricity affecting a farming operation. You know, if we go and start inhibiting people's ability to take steps to protect themselves, would that lawsuit have been allowed to proceed? Um, so Madam President, I appreciate that we're in a difficult circumstance. I believe absolutely that we should be not be asked to step forward and violate our core principles, our values, the things we're elected to uphold, the things we communicated to our voters that we would stand for and fight for over 13 times over in one bill. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Tomasoni. Madam President, I appreciate people's concerns for the bill. Um, um, the pollinator language that Senator Dibble referred to is, was in the um, 
the ag environment or the ag policy bill there is some money in here to fund some enforcement of it um, the, uh, the biofuels language that uh, people are referring to did take out a $750,000 appropriation to the to Bowser and I believe that's what people are concerned about but there are also incentives to promote the perennial grasses in the bill um, the uh, the the process that people refer to around here as Senator Weber referred to um, oftentimes gets mucked up there's no doubt about it um, it's interesting if it's a Senate provision in the conference committee report that um, ends up in the bill the Senate says it's a good provision if it's a house provision that ends up in the bill that wasn't in the Senate bill the Senate says it's a bad provision um, oftentimes uh, both happen where provisions that might be in the House or provisions that might be in the Senate but not in either other bill do end up in the bill. Um, it's part of the process and oftentimes people add amendments to bills that um, are completely foreign to um, either one of the bills. Uh, this particular bill, if you want to talk about water quality, has some very significant buffer language in it that if when it's implemented and it is followed should go a long way to cleaning up water quality in our rivers and our streams and um, it has some very good language and a lot of money to take care of the avian flu problem um, it's it uh, it's a bill that uh, I think we're we're looking at uh, some of the things that were in the 13 objections that that um, that Senator Dibble alluded to have been resolved through the governor's negotiations um, with with the speaker and so you know you don't always get what you want uh, in in these bills uh, but oftentimes um, uh, the bill that comes back and ends up in front of us is a bill that needs to be passed because um, we need to fund the government and uh, quite frankly um, the wild rice provision was totally agreed to by the PCA on how to do it there was uh, it's been a it's been a standard that has been around since 1973 that uh, had questionable reasons as to why it was that particular limit. Um, and the PCA agreed with that and they, 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 they realized that there's ma many different ways to look at these standards and I can go into a litany of what, what, what those reasons are but you've all heard them and I'm probably on record several different times saying them. Um, and we are, um, trying to figure out the best way to do it we're not trying to we're not trying to figure out um, how to get around it we're trying to figure out the best way to do it and what's the correct way and so you know um, many of the solutions that are in this bill maybe people don't like but at the same time there's a real lot of good things in the bill and Senator Root alluded to a lot of really good things in this bill and quite frankly I think the good things in this bill outweigh the bad and members I I, I hope that we we pass this because quite frankly um, I think it's it's uh, it's 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 been compromised several different times now and we're at a point where um, not passing the bill uh, could have some serious ramifications. Sarah Bonner. Madam President, I rise to speak about why I'm going to vote for the bill and I do so not for uh, our colleagues to understand because ultimately uh, when you think about it we're really here to represent the people the people who voted for us and so I'm here to let the people in my district know why I'm going to vote for this bill my guiding principle since I came to office my campaign slogan is actually uniting the middle and I say that because my district is a district that um, has been uh, research has shown is the district more than any other district in the state that does not affiliate with one party or another people just consider themselves free thinkers independent and and that's how they view themselves and so I do my best on every single issue to um, reach out to my community and ask them where you stand, what do you believe, and then to do my very best to work with all of my colleagues to come up with solutions that do in fact um, meet the values, the beliefs, and the philosophy of who I represent. And I also, uh, in doing so, understand that I'm a Minnesota state senator, not just a state senator from District 44, and in fact, uh, 
do what I do knowing that what we do actually makes a difference for our country and and so it is a much bigger perspective um, than one would think when first contemplating running for office and so uh, during the previous uh, time we were together I, I spoke about the challenge in divided government and how we are in some ways we have been given a gift so that we can demonstrate to our nation that you can actually govern in divided government that we aren't Congress we don't uh, gridlock we pass a budget we find ways to compromise and we get things done and so because of that I voted for almost every budget bill uh, at the end of the session and took great pride in that we did come up with uh, a budget that we could have passed uh, were it not for of course those final moments where we didn't get to everything but then uh, the governor uh, vetoed uh, the education bill and, and these two other bills and so uh, we had a new set of circumstances before us now I, I did vote against this bill last time because while my guiding principle is to forge consensus with this particular bill I wasn't at peace about this bill and I didn't think that it reflected the values and the philosophy of my constituents and so I did vote no but I stand here today in a different place because now I have to weigh the risks of another no vote I watched the governor, the House, and the Senate, whether or not we were front and center in every negotiation. I'm clear that we were uh, at the table during these negotiations. I watched very difficult negotiations take place. And we kept thinking we were going to have a special session, and then it was delayed, and it was, you know, we didn't know when. Let's remember, we didn't know we were going to meet here this morning till late last night, and it was really because of this bill. So there is not consensus on this bill. And so then I have to step back and say, what is the most important thing to the people I represent and, I, and to the people of Minnesota? And I would have to say that the most important thing is to be able to, uh, to pass a budget that will allow our state to go forward to pass a budget that will allow our schools to be funded, to pass a budget that will allow our state agencies to continue, and that there are provisions in this bill that I don't agree with. I am an environmentalist. My family had a cabin on the Boundary Waters my entire life. Uh, I've often talked it was the first cabin to burn down uh, in the, the horrible fire five years ago. I now, uh, we have a cabin uh, up in Senator Box district. And so I watch these issues very closely and I am concerned about these provisions. But I'm going to vote to keep government going because I think that the <coughs> risk of not voting for this bill is greater than anything else. And so I will pledge to the people of my district who are disappointed with my vote and to the people in this room who are disappointed with my vote and to all the environmentalists who have asked us to vote no on this bill to work on some of these provisions next year so that we can correct this. I do believe that the problems within this bill can be corrected and that this isn't the end of the day for these issues. That we do have another year to come back and I will promise to be a leader on correcting those things that aren't quite right with this bill but I will vote to support uh, the governor and the those who negotiated the the bill as it stands before us today thank you <laughs>